Okay, so today's class let us continue our discussion of uh, Green's functions of uh, many body systems at finite temperature. So, these are called Matsubara Green's functions. So, I told you that in the last class that uh, the Green's functions uh, are basically what we had described in real space that is uh, you remove or uh, insert a particle at some position r at time t and then you insert or remove uh, the same particle at some other position at some other time. So, that would correspond to uh, Green's functions and then you find the overlap between the two states starting and ending. So, that would correspond to the Green's function in real space real time. So, but however, I told you that uh, there is an advantage to thinking of the times as being purely imaginary in the case of uh, a system uh, at finite temperature. So, if you have a, a system uh, which is exchanging not only energy with its surroundings, but also particles are flowing in and out. So, if you are uncomfortable with that type of situation, you can just think of uh, you know an imaginary boundary of a subsystem within a larger system. So, if you think of it that way, then clearly both energy and uh, particles can freely flow in and out and then you have a kind of an equilibrium that is established uh, with uh, and then you will have a chemical potential. That means, these in that in instead of the number of particles being specified, what is specified is the chemical potential. But I told you again and again that for uh, systems that are large that means, the in the thermodynamic limit there is uh, no distinction at all between the grand canonical ensemble and the uh, canonical ensemble. So, if you do have a system with a uh, genuinely fixed number of particles, it is not incorrect to first study the system using grand canonical ensemble because it is mathematically simpler and then you uh, find a relation between the chemical potential which you are not interested in uh, and uh, you relate that to the density of particles which is uh, well and truly fixed in the case of canonical ensemble. So, then uh, you get back your canonical answers uh, very easily because you have started with the grand canonical ensemble. So, bottom line is that uh, you do what is needed to get the answers as quickly as possible. But uh, having done that, you see, uh, I told you that it is possible to rewrite these Green's functions in uh, momentum and frequency domain and specifically we exploit what are called the KMS boundary conditions. So, in order to exploit this, we have to first define a kind of time ordering. So, I told you that uh, you imagine the times to be between 0 and minus i beta h bar. So, if you do that, then you can define uh, the particle Green's function as uh, the uh, with a subscript uh, greater than sign. So, that way you can uh, define what is called a time ordered Green's function on the imaginary axis. So, um, having done that, uh, you can show that basically the, uh, the time ordered Green's function can be written in Fourier space and the Fourier components of the time ordered Green's functions are nothing but uh, th these quantities. So, that is if you are talking about free particles then it is going to be this and Z n is basically the Matsubara frequency. So, for fermions uh, the Matsubara frequency is uh, odd multiple of pi divided by beta. Remember that beta is inverse temperature and uh, for uh, bosons it is even multiple of pi divided by beta and mu is the chemical potential and epsilon k is the dispersion relation between uh, of the for, uh, of the particles. So, it is basically h bar square k squared by 2 m. So, this is for uh, genuinely free particles that means, particles that do not interact with anything. Uh, so, if that is the case then uh, this is the result, but I told you that uh, in situations where particles interact with each other it is clear that um, you know especially if the if the interaction is between particles the translational invariance of the system is still respected. So, momentum continues to be a good quantum number and on top of that it the system is still in equilibrium because there is no external driving uh, force the interactions are not due to some external source. 
So, it is some internally generated interaction. So, the system continues to be in equilibrium. So, uh, the Matsubara frequencies uh, are still valid and I told you the KMS boundary conditions are very general. They just have to do with the fact that uh, you know the psych it, it just utilizes the cyclic property of trace which is pretty much very general. So, because of that you see the Green's function is just a function of uh, K and the appropriate Matsubara frequency. So, bottom line is that you can always write uh, the Green's function with interactions in this way. So, that means you introduce a new function which accounts for the fact that the system interacts uh, with each other, the particles interact with each other. So, that is called the self energy. So, basically self energy uh, corresponds with a, it has a very uh, intuitively appealing name, it is called self energy. That means that is the energy generated by interaction of one component, one part of the system with another. So, basically the mutual interaction between particles. So, this would be so calculating the self energy for a system of mutually interacting particles is one of the central goals of many body theory. It is not easy and uh, usually many pe people use many approximations like perturbation theory, loop approximation and so on and so forth. So, uh, physically you see I told you that uh, one can uh, also start uh, studying some specific uh, quantities related to this uh, Green's function in momentum and frequency domain and specifically if you calculate the what is called a spectral function. So, this is called a spectral function. So, if you calculate this sort of thing, so where omega, so you replace formally uh, Zn by minus i omega plus delta. So, remember Zn is supposed to be some discrete quantity, but formally you can always replace it by some continuous quantity called minus i omega plus delta, where delta is a small real number. So, if you do that and you think of omega as real and delta as small and real, you will see that uh, as delta tends to 0, this big, this uh, spectral function for free particles becomes a Dirac delta function uh, evaluated at this quantity. So, that means it the, the spectral function peaks at omega equals E k minus mu. So, that corresponds to uh, uh, E k is the energy of the particles and mu is the chemical potential. So, that difference corresponds to the excess energy that uh, the particle has over and above the chemical potential. So, this we identify with the uh, uh, quasi particles. So, ba basically quasi particles are particles that uh, appear to move independent of each other in the system. So, you see he, this 10.68 is uh, assuming that the there is no mutual interaction between particles. So, there is no dis distinction between the original particles and the quasi particles, they are basically one and the same because there is no uh, mutual interaction between particles. So, in that case clearly the quasi particle energy should be uh, just trivially related to the energy of the original particles which is epsilon k. So, that is the reason why omega equals epsilon k minus mu is just shifted by the chemical potential. But however, more interesting things are possible when you have the self energy. That means, when you have mutual interaction between particles, then the spectral function uh, firstly will have two features. One is that it will not be a delta function, but it will be, uh, uh, it will resemble a delta function. It will be, it will not be strictly a delta function, but it will have a very pronounced peak usually at some value of omega. And uh, the uh, basically the width of that peak, uh, the fact that it is not delta function, but it is uh, broadened to some extent uh, reflects the fact that the quasi particles in the system have a finite lifetime. So, that is the physical meaning of the uh, width of that. And uh, the exact location of the peak also tells you the energy dispersion of the quasi particles, which may be uh, somewhat different from uh, what you see uh, for free particles. Okay, so, that we will come to a little later because that is the interpretation we are going to, it is not some guess or anything, we can actually deduce that interpretation very soon in just a few minutes. So, uh, but before I do that, uh, let me point out to you that it is possible to also uh, deduce the um, 
distribution the Fermi Dirac and Bose Einstein distribution uh, through this approach. So, that means if it is uh, uh, genuinely free particles, so suppose this is uh, for genuinely free particles I told you it is just this much. So, if I substitute for genuinely free particles you see you will get this result. Uh, it is going to be 2 pi delta of epsilon k uh, plus mu. I mean I have just flipped a sign you know that uh, delta function is even function. So, I am allowed to flip sign. So, uh, it is e raised to sigma. So, now you see omega omega is uh, if I integrate over omega I will just get 2 pi 2 pi cancels and this becomes nothing but e raised to beta epsilon k minus mu uh, then minus sigma. So, you see if sigma is minus 1 it is fermion. So, it is uh, Fermi Dirac distribution if sigma is uh, plus 1 it is uh, bosons. So, it is suppose Einstein distribution, but uh, you see the implication here is that this is not valid only for free particles. So, if A is I have just verified that if A is given very simply by this Dirac delta then it is uh, reduced to this familiar form of uh, Fermi Dirac Bose Einstein, but the interesting situation is when this, this is not given by Dirac delta, when you have quasi particles, when you have lifetimes and all that. So, when you have uh, those types of things then uh, it, this is still valid, but A is complicated because A is complicated C n sigma is also complicated. So, that is the distribution of uh, quasi particles will not be exactly for Dirac or Bose Einstein because the particles interact with each other. Okay, so, how do you calculate the lifetime and the new dispersion? So, the way to do that is uh, you first uh, re rewrite uh, first uh, formally insert uh, Z n as minus i omega pl plus delta you get this. So, now what you do is you uh, formally decompose this self energy into real and imaginary parts. So, clearly because this is as i delta it will have some uh, formally a real part a formally an imaginary part and I write it this way. So, if I do this then I, I take the imaginary part of. Uh, so, you see imaginary part of uh, a plus i b is nothing but b over so, because I can multiply and divide both sides by a minus i b. So, if I do that I, I will get a squared plus b squared uh, into a minus i b and the imaginary part of that is minus uh, minus b. Okay. So, so basically that is what I have done here. So, you see uh, it was uh, this is something like uh, a plus i b here this is something like a plus i b because you see sigma is uh, something plus i something. So, I can always write this as a plus i b and if I take imaginary part. So, it is like taking of 1 by uh, a plus i b uh, minus 2 imaginary part of that this one. So, it is like taking imaginary part of this quantity on both sides. So, imaginary part of 1 over a plus i b. So, that is basically um, b over a squared plus. So, that is what this a squared plus b squared and this is b and there is a 2 there. So, bottom line is that you see if you are uh, successful somehow in finding this difficult quantity called self energy, then you can always find uh, many interesting things. One is that you can convince yourself that the quasi particle energies are not really uh, trivially related to epsilon k which is the kinetic energy of free particles, but it can be very complicated because you will have to solve this nonlinear equation is the is basically this uh, Dirac delta is peaked at a uh, value where omega means when this becomes 0. So, that is where that uh, so it is basically something it will look something like a Gaussian with this, this this peak at omega equals that appropriate value of. Uh, so, that means some appropriate function of k. So, uh, it involves solving this uh, nonlinear equation because there is omega outside uh, omega is the unknown. So, you have to solve for omega. So, omega is outside it is also inside this sigma. So, somehow if you solve this you will get omega versus k. So, that is basically the it tells you the location of the uh, means it will tell you the dispersion relation of the quasi particle which may not be as simple as k squared by h bar squared k squared by 2 m it can be more complicated. But not only that uh, is uh, not only the, the 
dispersion relation of the quasi particle different from free particles, it also could have a lifetime. So, that means you can have a situation where the imaginary part of self energy is not 0. So, that means that uh, these quasi particles not only have a different dispersion from free particles, they are also not infinitely long lived. That means they have a finite lifetime. So, in general they will have a finite lifetime because in general imaginary part of sigma k comma omega plus i delta may not be 0, but there will be some situations where so the lifetime can be read off like this. So, it is just pi by imagine remember sigma is the units of energy. So, this has units of 1 by energy so and h bar is 1 in our calculations. So, basically this has a dimension of time. So, but of course, you can have a situation where some parts of you know you can simultaneously solve for this and you can ask yourself uh, when this is uh, 0 is this also 0. So, if, if this is also 0 then uh, it means that for those particular values of omega and k that particular quasi particle can be infinitely long lived and that is likely to happen very rarely if at all. Okay, so because it involves some specific value of k and some specific value of omega, but in general most of the quasi particles will have a finite lifetime when there is mutual interaction between particles. Okay, so, um, the other uh, perspective you can uh, utilize is that you can instead of uh, decomposing the Fermi energy this way you can uh, say that uh, look the real part of uh, this. So, rather than uh, decomposing into real part imaginary part you just look at the complex sigma itself right. So, you look just look at the complex sigma itself this just the complex sigma and then you ask yourself uh, what should be. Uh, so, if you solve this for complex omega. So, because sigma is complex and omega uh, if the solution will in general be complex. So, now you imagine that the solution is formally written as omega 1 which is real and plus i omega 2 where omega 2 is the imaginary part of omega. So, omega 1 is real part of omega, omega 2 is imaginary part of omega which is the solution of this complex equation because sigma is complex, omega is a complex solution of this equation. So, if you decide to do it that way then you see it is very easy to insert uh, the appropriate omega there and uh, you can uh, write down the uh, Green's function in this way also. And this quantity basically is called, so you can usually think of this as a pole. So, usually if, if this has a uh, if this has a 0, then clearly uh, the 0 of that uh, if if this is the if the if this is the root of this equation, this is a root of this equation, you can always think of it as uh, omega minus the root because it will just be uh, you know clearly it is going to be like that, but then it will be proportional to that and that proportionality constant uh, or will be a function of uh, k and that z k is basically called the quasi particle residue. So, it uh, measures the jump in the momentum distribution across the Fermi surface for fermions and it uh, measures the condensate fraction for bosons. So, basically it, uh, so you might be wondering what all that is and what am I talking about. So, basically let me tell you what that is. So, if, uh, if I am talking about fermions, you see you can always plot this n, n f k which is the uh, the average number of uh, particles uh, with momentum k. So, if if I am talking about uh, zero temperature and I am talking about particles that do not interact with each other, clearly the answer is this. It is uh, 1 if k is less than k f and 0 if k is greater than k f. So, uh, so if uh, this is and this is for k less than k f. So, it is just a step function for uh, non interacting particles at 0 temperature, but the interesting situation is that when you have interactions between particles uh, this uh, becomes like this. So, this is called uh, the quasi particle residue. 
So, usually uh, this will, so you can have that quasi particle residue at some other value of k also, but usually it is evaluated at k equal to k f. So, that is the interesting situation which tells you the jump in the Fermi uh, means in the is the jump in the discount the value of the discontinuity in the Fermi Dirac distribution. So, that is what that is. So, it just uh, tells you. So, whereas if it is bosons you see that uh, there are uh, n number of particle n 0 number of particles in the condensate and n minus n 0 number outside. So, basically this will tell you n 0 value this this will tell you the value of n 0 if k is 0 this condensate corresponds to k equal 0 and uh, z of 0 will correspond to n 0. So, that that is in some sense like a sudden jump. So, this is also sudden that is also sudden jump. So, uh, basically that is uh, how you describe uh, Green's functions for uh, interacting fermions and interacting bosons. Okay, so, now I am just going to introduce to you in the remaining few minutes I have, I will simply introduce to you the idea of non-equilibrium Green's function. So, till now whatever I have described is basically uh, systems in uh, thermodynamic equilibrium that means, I have a system which is uh, exchanging energy with surroundings and possibly also uh, particles with surroundings and coming to an equilibrium. But uh, many interesting uh, most uh, realistic systems uh, or many realistic systems in found in nature are not in equilibrium. Uh, the most interesting ones are living systems. You see uh, you know phenomena that take place inside say living organisms like inside a cell they are clearly not in equilibrium because uh, energy is constantly being supplied to the cell and many processes are taking place dynamically. So, if you want to study a living system using uh, you know the tools of physics which is of course incredibly ambitious and possibly quite foolish, but uh, still uh, there are people who try to do that uh, in some crude way and they are forced to reckon with the uh, fact that many of these systems are not in equilibrium. So, now you will have to encounter or uh, uh, you know take into account the fact that uh, you will. So, in other words you have to uh, be prepared to generalize the idea of uh, Green's functions to encompass uh, systems which are not in equilibrium. So, of course, uh, you know the systems that we are studying are quantum mechanical in nature. So, what I have in mind is some subatomic uh, particles that are possibly driven by some external fields like electromagnetic fields which are out of equilibrium. So, whatever it is, uh, whatever the source of that non-equilibrium nature of the system is that I am still forced to um, you know define and study these is appropriate generalizations of the Green's function to systems out of equilibrium. So, the question is how do I do that? So, um, to do that uh, I as usual uh, introduce my usual uh, you know evolution operators S matrix and all that which I discussed earlier, but it is very similar except in that now I have to uh, uh, take into account the fact that uh, the systems uh, that I am studying are not in imaginary time. So, the times are going to be purely real, but uh, because there is no concept of temperature, so there is no particular benefit in moving to imaginary time. So, the times are going to be purely real. So, I have to make sense out of this concept of time ordering if at all required. I, I have to redefine what it means for time. Uh, see, remember that I I define time order ordering in this peculiar way along the imaginary axis uh, because uh, it was very useful in uh, uh, ensuring that the Green's function defined in that peculiar way obeys periodic boundary conditions. So, I am entitled to define any kind of time ordering I want so long as uh, I also list out all the properties uh, that kind of a definition has so that I can utilize it later on. So, I mean I, I should be introducing such notions only if 
it benefits me in some way. So it's going to benefit me if I can show that that type of time ordering leads to say periodic boundary conditions to, in the Green's function and that's what I was successful in showing for the case of equilibrium systems. But for non-equilibrium systems, it's not at all clear what I should do because there's no question of a temperature in non-equilibrium systems. So there's no question of a minus i, beta, h bar and all that. So beta is inverse temperature, there's no concept of temperature in non-equilibrium systems. So I have to deal with that aspect. So, uh, so the idea is that you uh, first uh, make a mental note that in general the Green's function that you will be dealing with even if you are successful in defining time ordering in some appropriate way, you will have to not just uh, uh, you know find the expectation value of uh, these two operators but rather perhaps you will be compelled to form a kind of an ensemble average over some probability distribution. So having kept that in mind, so now let's go ahead and so I think this I am sort of repeating myself. So remember that uh, I was, I had defined something called the evolution operator where uh, I am evolving. So if I start this is just the Heisenberg picture, I am just unnecessarily repeating myself. This is probably from your elementary quantum mechanics. So you have this time uh, operator at some fixed time reference time TR and then I want to evolve it to some other later time t. So how do I do that? I simply introduce these Heisenberg evolution operators. And the point is that if this uh, system as of, uh, Hamiltonian is time dependent, I have to necessarily define evolution in this peculiar way, uh, which will involve time ordering uh, over times between TR and T. So now the thing is that uh, because I can split up this Hamiltonian into two pa parts, one is uh, time independent part which is H and the other is time dependent part which is V of S, I can always rewrite the evolution as a uh, standard unitary evolution with respect to the time independent part and a part which, uh, which is basically uh, depends on the interaction. So this would correspond to the interaction picture. Okay, I think now is a good time to st stop because in the next class I am going to tell you that this S obeys certain well known equations which I can then use to exploit to, to rewrite it in this, in this very standard way and then I can rewrite my fields in the interaction picture and then I can go ahead and recast the whole Green's function in the interaction picture and uh, we can proceed that way. So uh, I can understand that uh, many of these uh, lectures can be quite uh, technical and they, they may seem kind of very mechanical to many of you listeners but uh, that is something that cannot be helped. So you should if you feel bored uh, you can always uh, you know pause the video uh, you know think about these issues on your own and then uh, resume the video or you can consult the textbook relevant chapter and go through all the steps because you see that textbook has been written with a uh, specific purpose of uh, uh, filling in all the missing steps usually most of the textbooks uh, follow a lot of steps whereas uh, in my book I have made sure that many of the steps are explicitly given so that you know a, a student will not feel uh, taxed and uh, uh, harassed by uh, these concepts. So they can easily follow many of the steps that are being explained because they are explicitly written down. So I think you should spend some time reading the textbook uh, at leisure and try to uh, follow all the steps. Because in the lectures, I will just be breezing past uh, all those steps by just repeating all the steps verbally, which can be quite boring and also quite repetitive. So I, you should uh, necessarily go through the book and follow the steps on your own and then ask questions during the live sessions or uh, by email or whatever. Okay, I am going to stop here and in the next class, uh, let us discuss. Uh, uh, how to make peace with this concept of non-equilibrium Green's function, how to make sense out of them and how to utilize them in practice. Thank you. Mm -hmm.